Have you ever had something happen to you that changed your perspective on everything? For me, long ago when I was really young, Katie and I were just uh, starting out. And we were traveling home one evening from a long vacation on a busy interstate where a car on the heading the opposite direction jumped the grassy median and headed directly for us at top speed. I still can't figure out how we missed that car, but we did. But the car next to me wasn't so lucky. I pulled off to the side of the road and grabbed a flashlight and ran toward the two cars. And the car that had jumped the median uh, was still on the road. And the driver was getting out of the car and seemingly it was okay. So I headed off the embankment where the other car that was beside me uh, had ricocheted into. I ran down into that, uh, to that car and I saw, probably without a doubt, the most gruesome scene I had ever seen. The driver was still in his seat, but the entire front end of the car had crumpled all the way up and surrounded him. But that wasn't really what got me. He was staring at me, stunned eyes, pleading with his eyes, I guess. And I realized there was no way I could help him out. There was nothing I could do to help I could tell he was breathing, but he was breathing laboriously. And so all I realized I could do was hold his hand, maybe talk to him, maybe to try to keep him alert until the paramedics could arrive. So I talked and I, and I prayed, I pled. And then I watched and heard this 18 year old boy take his last breath. Katie and I drove the rest of the way home for hours in silence. When we got home, parked the car, grabbed each other by the hands and prayed. I knew that something big had just happened. Something though changed inside of me. Something changed in my perspective on life and on death, on, on being young, on, on having a future, and so much more. But at that moment, I really didn't understand all that it meant. Have you ever have something happen to you that changed your perspective on everything? Well, sure you have. Sure you have. There was a time in your life when you lived in a cozy, warm, loving space where your every need was taken care of, food and shelter and love. And then one day, almost without warning, you were thrust out into the world, grasping for every breath, looking at people you've never seen before, feeling cold and icky and naked. No wonder we cry when we're first born. It changes our perspective on everything. Or how about that first day riding the school bus or finding your best friend or being shunned at the lunch table? Or how about that time you realized as a teenager that you are actually smarter than your parents? <laughs> or that time in your 20s when you realize Maybe your parents were not as dumb as you thought. Our perspective on the world changes, doesn't it? How about that time you moved away from home or got a big job or got fired, got married? How about the time when your kids were born or a serious illness in your life or in your children's life or the death of a parent or divorce? or retirement. You see, we all have had experiences in which our perspective on everything changes, where we are forced to let go of all we have ever known, ever believed, ever held on to, and take a step into something new. But maybe at that exact moment, 
we really want, weren't quite sure what it all meant. You see, I think that's what the disciples were experiencing in today's scripture. One minute, they're hanging out with Jesus on some ordinary mountain when something pretty extraordinary happens. Jesus' clothes become dazzling, blindingly white. The Gospels of Matthew and Mark also tell this story, which gives you a hint of its, of its significance. Where they describe Jesus' face shining bright like the sun. And then, out of nowhere, Moses and Elijah show up. Just hanging out, talking with Jesus. How would you have responded if you were there? If this happened to you, if you witnessed this happening, what would you have done? What would you have said? I hope none of us would do what Peter did. Peter is well known for saying some of the dumbest stuff in the whole Bible. One of the things that he said comes right here. This is what Peter said. It's good for us to be here. Well, duh. <laughs> and then he says this. Jesus, do you want us to build some tents? Tents? Seriously? Build some tents? Yeah, Peter knew that something big happened. But he really had no idea what to make of it. And as if all of this wasn't enough, something even bigger happens. A bright cloud surrounds them and a voice booms. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. And then, just as suddenly, it was all gone. Back to normal. It was all the way it was. But something was different. Something changed. At that moment, the disciples might not be quite so sure of what happened and what it all meant, but they knew from that point on, their perspective on everything would have to change. You see, to this point, the disciples have been admiring Jesus of Nazareth, a carpenter's son turned rabbi. No doubt to the disciples, Jesus was an amazing man. He said some amazing words and, and did some amazing works, yet seemed like a man. But now, after Jesus was transfigured, there's little doubt that Jesus is more than a man. Every image, every symbol, every second of that experience reveals Jesus as that something more. Jesus' face and clothes glowing bright white harkens back to Moses when he encountered God on Mount Sinai and he came away with his countenance aglow. And the appearance of Moses and Elijah were the expected signs of the imminent arrival of the long-awaited Messiah. Everything they saw pointed to one and only one thing. Jesus is unmistakably, unequivocally, undoubtedly, unquestionably, undeniably. See what I'm doing there? He's the Son of of God. He's the divine son of God. The disciples' perspective on everything now changes. They realized, maybe for the first time, that Jesus is God. But more importantly, Jesus is their God. Has Jesus become God to you? Or are you still simply an admirer? Soren Kierkegaard once said in criticism of Christians, Jesus never asks for admirers, worshipers, or even adherents. No, he calls disciples. You see, since the beginning of Jesus' ministry, Jesus has been surrounded by admirers, 
Nicodemus was an admirer. Judas was an admirer. The admirer never makes any sacrifice. The admirer always plays it safe. The admirer may praise Christ, but renounces nothing. And the an admirer will never reconstruct their life. But a follower, a disciple, simply aspires with all his or her strength to become what they admire. Are you becoming what you admire? You know a follower when you meet one, right? Words like self-giving, self-sacrifice, service, surrender come to mind. Followers aren't afraid to talk about the choices they make in their life because Jesus is their God. They seek to grow in daily prayer and scripture reading and are deeply involved in a small group to help them become a better follower. Followers are actively engaging in ways to change the world. Admirers may come to church occasionally, may serve on committees, may even sing in the choir or preach from pulpits, take communion, intellectually understand the faith, but they haven't yet allowed Jesus as their God to define their life. The world has enough admirers of Jesus and too few disciples. Maybe that's why the Christian church seems to be losing members every year. Maybe the church has been spending more time building up admirers instead of making disciples. You see, we're facing a very difficult times ahead, and we are in desperate need of humble and bold, growing followers of Jesus who claim him as their God. Kyle Eidelman, in his book, Not a Fan, has it right when he says this, the biggest threat, the biggest threat to the church today is fans who call themselves Christians but aren't actually interested in following Christ. They want to be close enough to Jesus to receive all the benefits but not so close that it requires anything from them. If we are completely honest with ourselves, is Jesus really our God? So if you hear nothing else I say today, I want you to hear this. There's a clue in today's scripture that can guide us back to putting Jesus at the center of our lives, our church, and even the world. You see, God speaks only twice in the gospel. The first time God speaks is at Jesus' baptism, which we celebrated a couple of weeks ago, when the Spirit of God descended like a dove upon Jesus. And God said, this is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. The second time God speaks is today's scripture, here at the Transfiguration, with a subtle but very important difference. God says, this is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Listen to him. When Jesus is your God, you listen to him. You listen to him in the scriptures. And I, I don't know any other way to put it. But if you aren't reading your Bible every day, you can't possibly know Jesus's voice. So get started today. When Jesus is your God, you listen to him in prayer every day, praying in silence to hear Jesus, praying in pain for the hurting of the world, praying with hope and trust that Jesus will change you instead of God changing his mind. 
When Jesus is your God, you listen to him in the body of Christ. As you attend worship every week, yep, yeah, every week, Listening for Jesus in the songs, listening for Jesus in your small groups with fellow believers, helping you and others find ways to listen better to Jesus. When you listen, when Jesus is your God, you listen to him through the crying voices of the hurting and the hopeless and the loved less. You listen for Jesus among the homeless in room in the inn, among the hungry as you pack food. You listen for Jesus through the kid in your class no one, has, no one talks to. You listen for Jesus through the coworker you can't stand. You listen to Jesus when you need to forgive someone and when you are in need of forgiveness. You listen to Jesus when someone slaps you and you turn the other cheek. You listen to Jesus among the left out and the picked on, the stepped on, and the beat up and the downtrodden. You listen to Jesus not only when hurricanes and earthquakes strike, but you also listen to Jesus among the widows who are alone and lonely. You listen to Jesus when he says, I love you exactly as you are and I love you so much not to leave you that way and you listen to Jesus when he says when you see me as your God your perspective on everything will change and that will change the world. Is Jesus really your God? Lent starts in three days. It starts in three days on Wednesday, on Ash Wednesday. And I want to challenge you to use this Lenten season to listen to Jesus and this may be new for you. If it is, here's all I want you to try. Three things. Just three things. Each week during Lent, spend one hour in worship. Just one hour in worship. Spend one hour in a small group or with your Sunday school class. And one hour in service to others. That's it. Three hours a week. One hour in worship. One hour in a small group and one hour in service to others. Now, if you'd like to go deeper, consider beginning a daily prayer time. Maybe increase your giving to the church or strive to do a daily good deed for someone else without ever being noticed. If you do these things, if you decide now to do these things, maybe today, can be the moment you decide once and for all to no longer be an admirer of Jesus, but to become what you admire. And today would be the day that something would happen that would change your perspective on everything and the world will begin to change.